y todo lo que no pudimos, no pues yo cuando estaba en la pandemia no, no tenían que comunicarme y no pues yo no pude ver los trabajos que iba a hacer. Dass man die Freundin nicht sehen konnte, das war schon echt schade, weil man in der Schule, sie hat, da hat man sie eigentlich fast täglich gehört, gesehen, gesprochen, man durfte sich nicht mehr treffen. Das war schade, weil dadurch sind Freundschaften dann nicht so eng gewesen. You have change in meals because there was less money, such stuff. Es war sehr stressig, also in der ersten Monat, in der ersten Woche und es war irgendwie auch alles verplant und so weiter. 很多都可以跟同学一起做实验，自然课又只能自己一个人做，不能跟同学一起讨论。The internet actually helped me, cause、uh, I was kind of lagging behind. So during that time at home, I was able to catch up, and now I'm good. So. Also ich fand's schon komisch, weil ich war da erst in der zweiten Klasse und、ähm, habe ich die Schule auch gar nicht richtig gesehen. Und dann. This is how many children and young people worldwide experienced the pandemic. Their schools were closed. Often their parents lost their jobs. But now, around the world, classes are taking place in person again. Welcome to the COVID-19 special. In this show, we take a closer look at what it's like for students and teachers to be together in classrooms again. We head to Germany, Colombia, Nigeria, and Uganda. It's been more than eight months since Ugandan schools fully reopened, but teachers still aren't happy with their pupils' progress. Most of the children do not again pick anything completely. Even those ones even who knew even how to write their names, they could not again write their names. They could find again everything was very new to them, so we started like letter by letter, again teaching them. Others even even a hundred pencil with them. Others others even forgot even how to handle pencils.、Eh? In March 2020, Uganda announced the full closure of schools to manage the spread of COVID-19. Milka and Mbabazi thought it would last a week or two. But it dragged on for 22 months, becoming the world's longest school closure. Never even bothered me that I would spend like one month or one year at home, so I took a few books to revise. But unfortunately, time went on. They were never telling us that we have to go back to school. So I was like, "What's on now? What's the next thing I'm gonna do?" Milka Anambabazi is finally back in school. But her grades have dropped. It affected me in my performance in senior four, and made me need to take a combination that I wanted. I wanted to do head, that is history, econ, and divinity, stroke ICT, stroke sub math. But since I never performed like the way I expected, it made me, it forced me to take a combination that wasn't in my expectation. Many students are struggling to catch up now that they're back at school. Teachers say that it's even harder for those who had started working during the two-year school break. They, they, we are always thinking of their businesses aside. Some of them we discover they have stores, chapati stores. Yeah, they have been attending to、uh, matoke、uh, stores. Are you getting it? So they could get some money, which has been a challenge. We find that even some girls are not concentrating. They engage in coupling, expecting something from the boys, because they have been used to getting some money. It's hard to concentrate in class now because my mind is more exposed to many things. Then I didn't know a lot of things because I had less time to focus on the outside world. I had only my books and then me and then school. But then after, then in COVID, we were exposed to working. Instead of being here, I would be working and making my own money. 
because most of, most of my friends are there outside making good money and pass it back again in school. The Uganda National Examinations Board reports that students have performed poorly since the pandemic. Numeracy, or the ability to do basic math, has fallen by over 13 per cent. And more pupils have also dropped out of school, often due to COVID-induced poverty and teenage pregnancies. 30,000 adolescent girls were reported to have been pregnant during the COVID period, meaning that there was 1,000 girls on daily basis getting pregnant. Surely that's a disaster for our country and it is going to have a vicious cycle because you will not have a skilled labor, you will not have a very productive labor, you will have a, a, a population that's, that is largely peasantry. The UN reports that even before the pandemic, nearly 60% of the world's 10-year-olds could not read and understand a simple text. COVID-19 has now deepened that crisis, especially in sub-Saharan Africa. Schools in Nigeria were also closed for months due to the coronavirus pandemic. And here too, the authorities, but also international organisations and companies, have tried to reduce the resulting educational deficits by developing digital learning models. But not everyone was able to benefit from it. Zainab and Amarat Adejare are preparing for the new school year. Both sisters topped their classes last year and are determined to do that again this semester. They're taking lessons on a digital platform called the Nigeria Learning Passport. Now I'm studying biology, and under the biology I'm studying pollution and time, time, types of pollution. On the Nigeria Learning Passport, preschool to secondary school pupils can register to take video lessons on demand. I like studying with the Nigeria Learning Passport because it makes me understand there is no noise, I can record it, I can pause it so that I can jot it down and I, and I can understand it very well. Nigeria recently joined 20 other countries to adopt the learning passport. It's a tool that was developed by UNICEF and Microsoft to help students continue learning in spite of academic disruptions. The learning passport actually initiative started uh, about two, three years ago. Uh, in Afghanistan, in the emergency context environment. Uh, but the deployment, uh, deployment uh, actually was accelerated with the COVID-19 pandemic uh, that struck the, the world. It's the first day of school. Good morning, class. Good morning, Mr. Sadi. Good morning. Sit down. Zainab's teacher introduced her and other classmates to the Nigeria Learning Passport. Now she wants to see if the students actually used it. How many of us use the learning passport to study at all, apart from creating the profile? Don't be shy, stand up. Zainab is one of just four pupils. Others say their parents can't afford data, smartphones or tablets, so they can't learn online. Almost half of Nigerians have no internet access. The government is working to make the learning passport available offline, but expects to reach just 3 million of the country's 20 million children by year's end. Back at home, Zainab and Amarat are doing their afternoon chores. They don't know how much longer their parents can continue to buy data for their online lessons, but they plan to use every opportunity to fulfill their dreams. Yes, I, I need to be educated because I want to become a medical doctor. I want to um, study medicine. So, and without education, there's no I want to achieve all this, my, all my goals without me not being educated. While pupils like Zainab and Amarat are lucky to have access to the learning passport, millions of other children in Nigeria may never get the chance to use it. Digital learning was also widespread on other continents during the pandemic, such as Latin America. But in Colombia, it became clear that there was also a downside, and the inequality between rich and poor was also brought into stark contrast. 
Colombia's Constitutional Court says that many young people did not receive the education they needed during the lockdowns. Diana Trubinho is a sixth grade student at a public school in Colombia. She completed the fourth and fifth grades at home using WhatsApp, but she feels that she didn't learn enough. Since the pandemic, it's more difficult to keep up at school. In fifth grade, I understood some things, but not everything. I felt anxious. I thought, what if they ask me stuff and I don't know anything, that they might be angry with me? To help improve her academic performance, Diana is attending extra lessons outside of school. She says she's happy to sacrifice her free time because it's helping her to catch up at school. My reading comprehension has improved. I wasn't reading well before. I also enjoy reading and writing much more than I used to. I didn't used to be into reading much. The extra lessons were organized by teachers like Fabian Velasco. The classes help him to understand the difficulties that his students are facing so that he knows how he can best support them. He is well aware that the pandemic created bigger challenges for public school students. Many of the children had connectivity issues. Their families just didn't have enough phones and laptops. It was all very limited. Schools and other educational institutions tried to find solutions, but it wasn't easy. There were families with two or three children, but only one working device. As a result, the gap in education standards between private and public schools grew during the pandemic. Experts say the inequality was already there before COVID, but the pandemic has exacerbated the problems. Thousands and thousands of children and young people in Colombia had their right to education denied during the pandemic. Two out of every three young people in public schools in Colombia did not have a computer. So for a good part of the last two years, those students were unable to continue their education. Many feel they now need to work harder to catch up with students at private schools. Maria Juliana is also attending extracurricular classes. The pandemic has definitely made things more difficult. In eighth grade, sciences like chemistry and physics became individual subjects. But that was when everything went online. So I missed out on all the basics of these subjects. Now in tenth grade, the material we're learning is much more complex, but I feel like I don't have the basics. Maria Juliana says academic challenges aren't the only problem. She's noticed that many of her classmates are now more anxious and insecure than they were before the pandemic. Yes, it's something you notice, and I think we sometimes just ignore it. Maybe because we think they're exaggerating or that these mental health issues are considered trendy. But these are problems that are affecting a lot of students right now, mainly because they spent the entire pandemic glued to an electronic device and that increased their problems. The school has actually decided to limit the use of cell phones and tablets. Assignments are now written by hand instead. The school is also urging students to ask for psychological help if they need it. Many of the students are experiencing problems. They've been exposed to screens for two years without limitations. Many are now addicted to devices. They were also exposed to pornography that invaded their homes without limits or controls. When they were at school, we regulated everything. But at home, that was impossible. Schools in Colombia are doing all they can to give back to their students the lost years. It's a daily effort that requires a major commitment, not just from the teachers, but also from the students. Worldwide, children are back in the classroom. In the Northern Hemisphere, autumn and winter are approaching. Many fear a new wave of coronavirus infections. What are schools doing to prepare for that? What are their biggest concerns? In Germany, worries about another COVID-19 outbreak are compounded by the current energy crisis.
The new school year began all quite normally, without masks or COVID tests. A huge relief for students at the Paula Fürst School in the southwestern city of Freiburg. It caters for children from elementary school to university entrance age. Still, school director Gerd Pollack is concerned about the weeks ahead. Experts say the infection numbers could rise considerably this fall. The government says it's well prepared, but Gerd Pollack isn't convinced. We're not getting any details on what preparations have been made. As a school, we're pretty uninformed as far as COVID regulations for the fall are concerned. We don't know what measures are to be taken if there's a new wave of infections. We'll probably be told what to do at the last minute, just like last fall, but then still have to carry everything out very carefully, which means as a school, we'll have to act very fast. Die, die Erforderlichkeit einer sehr schnellen Umsetzung. In other words, things would be very stressful again in schools. Teachers associations are calling for a clear action plan. But so far, all that's been said is that measures in schools could be tightened up if the situation requires it. The government wants to remain flexible. Most of the children aren't bothered, as long as there's no return to online classes. It'd be a shame after we've started to relax and gain confidence in the situation to have the feeling that that's all going to be taken away again. If they bring back masks or testing, that's OK. Obviously, it's simpler without. What would be good is if we could at least stay in school. One thing seems clear. There are no plans to close schools again. But if infections soar, there could be a move to reduce class sizes, with some of the students watching online from home. Teachers here don't relish that prospect, but say it would be doable. If that's a decision that is taken and there's no way around it, then we'd manage. We're equipped with various digital platforms, we've bought more iPads and laptops, and we're getting more training for our teaching staff so that they're up to date with things. We have two years of experience now. We know we can divide the children into groups, and that makes things more relaxed. What's generating more debate among colleagues at the moment is the energy crisis, which will be a double whammy coming together with the COVID crisis this autumn. It's yet another challenge for schools, particularly because of the need to have plenty of fresh air. Many classrooms now have aerosol filters, but they're not sufficient on their own. Schools are still required to ventilate classrooms regularly, which makes it more difficult to save energy. The dilemma for us is that we're supposed to ventilate as much as possible, but we're also supposed to keep the room temperature at a comfortable level, which means heating more. Unless you have great equipment that heats the fresh air coming in, you have to turn up the heating more to keep the room temperature stable in winter. And we don't have a solution for this dilemma. There's no strategy for how we're going to deal with it. I guess we'll just have to try and find a happy medium. But some classrooms could get a little chilly this winter. At least that's what many parents fear. The school's parent representative is calling for a pragmatic approach. The children can wear warmer clothes. You can try to ventilate while the children are outside, unable to move around to keep warm, etc. But of course some parents are worried their child could get sick because the classrooms won't be ventilated as much. They fear the children will pay the price. There's been some quite inflammatory comments because people are worried. The children could be facing another strenuous winter. But then again, maybe the adults are just worrying too much. I'm pretty optimistic. And you need to be. We wouldn't have gotten through this time without a bit of optimism. Of course, you do worry about it now and then, but I want to focus on the present. That's what we learned during the pandemic, to enjoy what you have in the here and now. No one knows how bad the predicted new wave of infections will be in the fall. 
The Paula First School is prepared as well as they can be under the current conditions. Developing and improving vaccines is still keeping researchers busy. Could a vaccine administered through the nose help protect us all from another wave? China and India have just approved it. How's it supposed to work? When you're given a standard set of COVID-19 vaccines via injection, it kicks off a response in the cells nearby, causing your immune system to begin producing antibodies. Other parts of your body soon begin churning out protective cells, called memory T-cells and B-cells, creating what's known as systemic immunity. This means protection against the virus is spread throughout the body's systems. Initial exposure to SARS-CoV-2, however, happens in a specific place, the upper respiratory tract. This is where the virus invades, but it can take time for the protective cells and antibodies to reach here. One potential way to amp up the response is to apply vaccines via a spray directly to the area where respiratory bugs get into the body, creating more localised protection where it's needed most. Kind of like putting guards at the front door of a house to fend off intruders, rather than in the attic or the basement. This is called mucosal immunity because it's created in the membranes exposed directly to the outside world. The goal is to make it impossible for the coronavirus to gain a foothold. Other advantages that nasal sprays have over injections include not having to train personnel as intensely to apply them. And, of course, they take needles out of the process entirely. Nobody likes those. Many nasal vaccine candidates are currently in clinical trials, and a few have now been authorised in some countries, including China, India and Iran. Because so many people have already been vaccinated via injection, the authorised nasal vaccines are mostly aimed at providing updates to protection by kickstarting mucosal immunity. This supplements the underlying systemic immunity provided by injections and provides an extra layer of immune system support right where it's needed most. Nasally administered COVID vaccines still have to clear regulatory hurdles in most countries but more of them will one day likely see wider use because they'll make getting regular boosters also to other respiratory diseases a simple and painless process. Before we go, let's hear a little more from children from different parts of the world telling us what it's like to be back in school. Thanks for joining us. Stay healthy and we look forward to seeing you again next week. Um, it was kind of difficult for me. I had to wake up at four. At home I used to wake up at any time I want. I get anything that I want. At school it was difficult. And I had to catch up with books. I used to relax, sit on my phone. Generell wünsche ich mir für Corona, dass wenn das ist, wenn ein Lockdown gibt, dass es gut klappt, am besten noch besser klappt und dass wir das gut hinbekommen. 就是人际关系，我觉得是一个最重要的。就是功课能少一点，然后体育课比较多节，然后有些是用平板上课。Em busco yo bonita. Hubo más niños. Más amigos, más maestros. Estuvo mejor. I was used to being online. That when I when I came back at school, like I'd forgotten everything. I I had stopped revising my books, so it also declined my studies. Estar en educación física y estar con el cubrebocas porque se siente uno que se ahoga. Wir müssen keine Masken mehr tragen und auch nicht testen, aber also das vergisst unsere Schule die ganze Zeit. I used to perform well, but I'm no longer performing well. I used to do, I used to revise my books, but now I'm no longer revising my books. Pues fue todo diferente, hubo amigos nuevos. Ahora teníamos que utilizar cubrebocas, teníamos que estar en espacios más separados de todos, no podíamos compartir nuestros alimentos o útiles escolares. 
we started catching up, we started going for Zoom classes. Furthermore, at the end of the semester, we found out that we were already having our exams. We did them online, we submitted, and we are now moving and on track. Ya vi muchos compañeros y me gustó porque ya quería estar en la escuela. Also, es ist schon wieder normal. Man kann sich testen. Man kann auch Maske tragen, aber man muss nicht. Bei uns waren heute auch nur drei Kinder da, weil der Rest Corona hatte.